Yes. Continue. Okay. So hi. Hi. Nice to meet you. Andy. Would you like to start off just by saying your name and where you are? I'm Lucy Ball and I am in England. I'm in the southwest of England. Okay. And the first question is, who are you as a human being? Who are you as a person? And that can be values, qualities, passions, anything you'd like. I think I might be someone who doesn't like being interviewed. <laughs> There's this strange kind of quality of coming of your questions coming towards me, which I'm just going to have to get used to. <laughs> For Gestalt therapists who are used to dialogue, it's a little odd. <laughs> yeah, there's a reason why we like being the ones that ask the questions, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a place to start. So I'm not, I'm not a Gestalt therapist. Okay. I'm a coach. I work in organizations. Um, but I'm heavily Gestalt influenced. Um, particularly in the last seven to eight years. Um, I am a member of the faculty at the Gestalt International Study Center in Cape Cod. Um, so that's my Gestalt connection. Um, but if I pan out from Gestalt and one of the things I strongly identify with at the moment is just being an animal, you know, being a being a mammal that gave birth to live young and needs water and food and can be killed by viruses. And so that I, I think I've always had a real sort of respect for nature and love of it and joy in it. And I really feel more than ever our, our place in it in the web of life right now. Um, so that's, that's just what comes up today. Hmm. Interesting. And about your structure as a human animal, would you say that there's any particular values that you hold? Well, I guess my values might show up in what I like, how the things I do. Mm -hmm. Um, my kids would probably tell you that there must be a value somewhere that's related to me always wearing an apron. Like, <laughs> I'm always in my apron in the house. I get teased for that. Um, so there's something about food. <laughs> um, I think nature, I mentioned that uh, the kind mm -hmm. of joy of wonder in pain at the degradation of the natural world. And, um I'll interrupt a conversation to point out a bird. Um, I think when it gets to the, to the human world, I think I have some values around curiosity and, and playfulness, uh, kind of what's going on here and how can we riff on it? You know, there's, mm -hmm. um, I have a very, um, wonderful colleague who once said you have your silly balanced with your sensible and there's a I'm, I'm attracted to a, a little bit of silliness and wordplay and fun you know a bit of on the dance floor I'm as interested in expressing myself as I am in messing about you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so right, there may be some kind of creativity in there um, yeah so a little bit about your history. What mm -hmm. comes to mind as a particular event or as a set of circumstances in your life that you would say have shaped how you understand yourself or who you are? Wow. My mind goes to my grandparents. Um, I knew three of my biological grandparents growing up. Um, one had died when my mother was quite young, how her father died. Um, so I, th I think I'm shaped by um, 
a sort of post-war generation in, in the UK. Um, so first of all, even further back, back, I'm aware that um, on my father's side, our family has roots in Germany. So my, my maiden name is Schlemmer. And late 1800s, some German musicians came over for, to London to play music and my ancestors were part of that migration. And then we had the war with Germany and then the, my, my grandparents represented a real, you know, we've been through suffering, we don't waste anything. We, we want to be very competent um, and work hard, the kind of Protestant work ethic there. Um, and, a, and a sense of sort of edu educate yourself and do well, you know, pe people were teachers, engineers, architects. And then I guess what comes with that is also a sense of my, my privilege and how supported I've been um how lucky I've been um sort of riding that post-war wave of growth and stability and education and opportunity um and riding that as a woman as well so there's something in there about you know my mum was an, an administrator and a secretary and later a magistrate but not until her later life and um but I've always had a lots of role models for being a working woman. Mm -hmm. And how so has that yeah. led you, how has that led you to understand yourself as a woman or within your gender? I think I've had some permission to be a little bit um, ballsy. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't always feel it. It takes a lot out of me to be courageous and not shy. And um, but I've, you know, but I've also had the, I've also had parents and teachers and grandparents who've been interested in what I have to say and encouraged my intellect. Um, so I, th I think I do hold something in my identity about being this sort of um, generation of women that are trying to have it all, you know, and also experiencing how uh, there's some downsides of that as well. Exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's probably entered into my the way I want to relate to a partner as well, and that, you know, what what does a modern family look like, and what does um, a modern workplace look like. Um, yeah. Okay. And mm -hmm. you mentioned the term privilege. I'm wondering how you understand or use your privilege and your power. Mm. Well, I guess like many of us, we've, we've had some, you know, some recent calls to go back to that question if it wasn't in our mind already. And um, one of the answers is not enough. Um, you know, although I've always, I've always felt that I'm doing some good in my work and as a mother and a friend and, a, um, you know, it's largely with a bunch of other privileged white people that I'm doing that. So I've, I've certainly had, um, cause over the last couple of years to really ask myself what you know how do I want to spend I'm 47 you know maybe it's a midlife question as well um whatever you know what more difference can I make do I want to make um I've got some way in thinking about that around climate change and environmentalism which you know sort of passions of mine um, I'm starting to work with some organizations around diversity and inclusion, um, but it's still still a not fully answered question for me. Mm -hmm. you, you touched on another aspect there, which is your age. How do you understand or experience 
this age that you're living yourself in. <laughs> the age of 47. Mm -hmm. um, I had a very disconcerting meeting with a financial advisor who arrived with information about my pension, which was that I was destined to die at 92. Oh. So, which she, she felt I should know because if I was planning to retire at 60, I would have 32 years left of, uh, to pay my way. <laughs> Um, I mean, who knows how long I've got left, but there's definitely a sense of, well, that's, you know, given what's happening in the planet, that's probably a very optimistic estimate, but I'm at least halfway, if not. <laughs> so there's a kind of halfwayness about it. There's a, mm -hmm. you know, my kids are coming up to that end of the runway well my 15 year olds near near the end of the runway although you know do kids ever really take off for good these days or do they end up just coming back and <laughs> um so yeah there's there's a sense of you know fa a phase of life where maybe you know i'm not wiping bottoms and thinking about the next meal every minute of the day um and just trying to juggle and get by and i've got a bit of spaciousness to think where do I want to spend my time and energy? And there's, there's opportunity in that, but there's also some, um, yeah, questions <laughs> and experiments and working working through that, I guess, is what I feel like I'm doing right now at 47. Mm -hmm. It is that mid-life kind of thing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. the other day I was offered a prepaid, prepaid funeral package. I thought, no, that's a little <laughs> ahead of its time, thank you door-to-door -door during a pandemic offering prepaid funeral packages <laughs> no, i don't see myself there quite yet but... okay. yeah yeah so and just switching up a little bit i am wondering how you met gestalt how did that piece come into your life oh um i was um in a large consulting firm. I was working for Deloitte Consulting, big American firm in, in London. And I went on, um, I'd, I'd started some coaching training um, and got the, got the bug and started to go on more and more um, continuing professional development in the area of coaching. And, and I did one course, which was it's a really short course and it was on three psychological approaches to coaching. And it looked at um, psychodynamics, CBT, and Gestalt. And um, I just remember, um, even at the point where the Gestalt theory was being spoken about, just lighting up. And then we got to have an afternoon of playing with Gestalt techniques. And then um, it was like this, um, I think a relief. It was like, oh my God, you know, somebody has created a philosophy theory framework that suits me, <laughs> you know, where that, that seems to fit. Um, and then that led to a, just a real thirst for more and more experiences and more teachers and um, yeah, it was that, that I'll, I'll never forget that first experience of feeling like someone had described uh, what I knew in my bones already somehow, but would never have been able to describe. And are you able to pinpoint what it is that you found? What, what elements um, made most sense or deeper sense to you? I think there's two. And um, there's a danger when you say that because you might only remember the first one. <laughs> the, no, you said I think there's two, so that's okay. Uh, okay. There are two in my head now. Quick, get them out before I forget them both. So the first one is um, this coaching thing is not just about this. Mm -hmm. It's about all of this everything that we don't really see much of beneath the zoom window these days but it's not intellectual it's not just intellectual it's not just cognitive it's um so i'm allowed to have a feeling and share it i'm allowed to um notice what's going on in someone's body language and 
pay attention to it. I'm allowed to, there was this sort of permission to be whole. <laughs> um, and then the, I think the other thing was, was the this, was the, the, the paying attention to what's between that relational, it's not my brain and your brain and you're separate from me and I'm separate from you somehow encapsulated in our different cognitive bubbles. It's, it's there's something being co-created here that, and that's the work. That's what really uh, more of the, you know, the dance of the conversation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that appealed to something that just feels like it's in my bones and a sort of aesthetic quality and that, you know, that might be about music or a painting or the, I love the way ink flows out of my fountain pen onto the page, but it's also, it shows up in a conversation, the sort of how space is being shared, the rhythm, the tone, the, all of that became part of the territory, which um, was so much more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when you said aesthetic, my brain said, and ethics, ethics, just because at the beginning you said, I don't know if I like to be interviewed. And I thought it's, it's almost an ethical thing about where's the other person? Yeah. It's not fair, where's the other person? <laughs> <laughs> there, there needs to be two of us. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I've got, I have a real sense of that. And I, I know there's some of my own, I know some of my backstory about this, mm -hmm. but when there's two or more people in a conversation, I think I've always been curious about um, place, power, mm -hmm. <laughs> dominance, sharing. Um, that's something that I've been curious about, but also struggled with, you know, so we're, you know, we're all working through our own stuff through the work we do you know how do I intervene mm -hmm. if somebody's taking over or um how do I find my voice when it's not being asked for or um how do I help these two people instead of being like this be like this because or <laughs> mm -hmm. Hmm. there's some aesthetics around that that I think I've always, they've probably always been sensitive to Mm -hmm. And so when you find this and when you understand this and start working this way, what happens to you as a person? How are you affected by Gestalt? Mm. Well, there's something that kind of... <sighs> I think there's a... I feel grounded um i feel more connected less isolated um i mean certainly when when i am being supported by a gestalt practitioner myself in therapy or supervision or i adore and remember all of the times in which someone has just welcomed all of me my quirks my process my resistance um and look to support what is you know that sort of wonderful feeling of how the paradox you know being being on the end of the paradoxical theory of change has you just go oh it's okay you know it's we don't have to try mm -hmm. um And I love the, I love trying to help other people experience that, you know, get truly curious about how they are. Um, and to, to one, of, one of the things that we talk about a lot at the Gestalt International Study Center is, is resistance and how how do we respond to resistance? How do we welcome resistance? How does it become delicious? And um, that's all in the mix for me. And then I love to work with a co, 
intervener as well. It's also mm -hmm. in, in the Cape Cod model that we teach at the center, we're often working in a pair. And so there's something about what's going on here. Um, hmm. I don't even remember your question now. <laughs> no, it was, it was how you were affected as a person. Yeah. And it's just, it seems to be a, a lot of layers and a lot of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm also wondering, do you feel like you're part of a Gestalt community? Does that mean anything to you? It does. You said at the beginning, you know, no, no, I'm not a therapist. <laughs> it's like, okay. Oh, that's just my, uh, that's my imposter syndrome. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a therapist. Um, I am actually a student therapist as well as a coach, but um, no, that's my, um, that's about that, you know, there are coaches who are gestaltists and they work in organizations and there mm -hmm. are therapists who, and they work with, with in health and a clinician mm -hmm. and that's all of that. And then there's, there's a kind of, am I good enough to be teaching groups that are, have got psychotherapists in when I'm not one? That's all of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, ask me the question again. I just got wrapped up in my- it's Whether you're part of a community, a Gestalt community. community. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've, I began to feel that in the UK, the more I met Gestalt influenced coaches, um, and I've been part of a couple of significant Gestalt groups in the UK um, that are significant to me. Um, but I, I think my sense of community has really accelerated since visiting the Gestalt International Study Centre in Cape Cod and um, just really finding a home for my own learning there um, and then starting to contribute to that community more um, and now doing some teaching and so that that feels like a real community within a community <laughs> um, and then I then I noticed in, in the invitation to talk to you that I you know I already just have this sense of oh we're in the same community <laughs> so then there's a kind of trust and some assumptions about ethics and safety and values that go go with that so this has actually been really easy to convince people to do this just complete strangers on the internet so yeah but it, it doesn't feel like you're a complete stranger you know first of all it was carol brockman that said mm -hmm. come you know go talk to um heather in this project and if it comes from carol i already trust it and then um the, there is something it doesn't surprise me that you've had that experience. Mm -hmm. hmm. So what has not worked so well? What do you identify as some challenges that you faced, either in your own process or as a professional, or if there's a significant challenge in a different part of your life that you're welcome to talk about it? Um, I When I first met um gestaltists um i had a problem understanding them some of the words they used seemed mysterious to me i even felt like a little like i was a bit stupid for not getting it some of the way they spoke about things made me uncomfortable um so I still think that that is a challenge, particularly it, I work in organizations and you know, there tends to be a culture in large Western European or American owned organizations that is incredibly task focused, pacey. Um, you know, I've had, I've had a client work with me for a long time and then um, move on to someone else and one of the reasons given was oh Lucy there are too many pauses too much reflection <laughs> and I that's I think some of that is I like some of that about how I work but I also think it's I, I'm back to the perceived weirdness index it's like you've mm. got to not be too weird <laughs> to influence someone yeah, you, you have to be able to get in to make an impact right yeah, so, and I've had that experience from the other side. You know, I get it. I get that 
this way of working, this in the moment, raising awareness, um, not rushing to label or interpret, but not rushing to act is tricky in a culture that's very different to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at home, at, in organization, <laughs> teaching. Um, so, I, and I, so I still, so something about the accessibility of what we do and that I, ca I care about and um, want to be, want to be a bridge, I think. Mm -hmm. I have to be able to hold the right amount of the gestalt weirdness though, otherwise. Yeah, I feel like much of my, you know, if I have any power to influence things, it comes from my gestalt weirdness. Um, but, you know, too weird and you don't have the, you don't have the license to, to, to be in the conversation, so. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. true, that's very true. So what has gone well? What comes up for you as a high point in your experience? Oh. I find it hard to, the, the word well is problematic for me. So I might, what I can think of is times that have felt right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, times where that there's felt like good connection, good groups coming together around something and you you know you facilitated that even if your role has been a little bit un intangible to other people or even yourself. Um, seeing, seeing pairs be stronger, two people working together be stronger, seeing a leadership team be stronger, be braver, be more connected, allow each other's voices, embrace each other's differences. You know, those are some of the peak experiences at work, I think, for me. Um, and they can be overtaken by events and destroyed the next day. And so that, you know, I think that's why I'm a little bit allergic to what's gone well, it's sort of, mm -hmm. But there are moments when you kind of aesthetically feel this was it, you know, this is what they wanted, this is what they, um, this is what I've supported. And then I think there are the more intimate moments, you know, with a one to one client or with my son or um, where I've managed to remember my skills and um, be useful. <laughs> <laughs> not be reactive, not be caught up, not be, um, not be too hooked by my projections and my own stuff and are, are, are able, to, you know, have just really connected with, with an individual. It's interesting that you mentioned that with a client or with your son. Would, how would you say all of this has influenced you as a parent or is influencing your children? It's made me all so aware of all the things I've done wrong. <laughs> There's not a moment goes by in a Gestalt workshop when I don't go, oh, that went wrong. <laughs> no. Oh, I wish I'd done that differently. Um, I guess I'm crit self-critical in many ways. Mm. Um, I think it has given me more toolkit to draw on for sure so mm -hmm. one of my kids watched the David Attenborough documentary called Extinction for his biology class yesterday I am so glad of my gestalt training when he comes down to the kitchen in despair <laughs> um, I'm so glad of my own therapy and that I have a place to work, work through my own despair. Um, I am so glad that I've been able to process some of my own upbringing and habits and choose what I want to pass on and what I don't want to pass on. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm so hard for me not to ask 
you as a fellow mother <laughs> will be like for you. Well, I think it's like you said, it's about feeling a little bit better resourced. I mean, it's like, I, I do have choices, not just what I came in with. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a lot about meeting the person. I, I've learned how to calm down and meet a different person. And so I don't assume that I know who my kids are. I'm mm -hmm. excited about meeting them. It's like, oh, now who are you? <laughs> and I'm allowed to change. They're allowed to change. I think that's nice. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Well, the last thing that I would ask you is, because it's interesting, you sort of said you're in this midpoint. Um, right. What's next? Where are you headed professionally or personally? And where do you think Gestalt can go? Hmm. Well, I feel like I'm new to teaching Gestalt. So um, I'm very new to the faculty at GISC. Um, so for me, that's, that's a path I want to walk and learn a lot and practice a lot. Um, you know, I'm very aware of the age of some of the people you've been interviewing. <laughs> um, you know, some of them dear teachers of mine and um, so I do, you know, I do, I do have a sense of, you know, my kids think I'm ancient, but I feel like an apprentice <laughs> to some of those guys. So, it, you know, if this is the community I choose and this is the field I want to continue to grow in that's got legs for me how do I, how do I be a good apprentice you know how do I who are the next wave of those octogenarian wise gestaltists coming up through um and then then my mind also goes to just the enormous challenges that groups institutions organizations teams humanity is facing at the moment. And I, as much as I love the craft of one-to-one -one work with someone, I, I really hope that we, the Gestalt community can have more influence on the systems that we are part of. Um, and to really apply ourselves to the polarization on the planet, the, the you know the shutting off from awareness of things that uh, we're not facing into. Um, where's democracy going? You know those. Mm. I don't have any answers to all of that, but I really feel the need. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I mean, there's there's a need, there's an availability, and and there's an interest. I mean, a lot of people have said. You know, I want I want to go further. I want to have more of an impact. Not me as a person, but Gestalt could be doing more. So there's there's opportunities. There's, yeah, there's kind of like this shift in in people not just saying, oh, I want to build a successful private practice and buy myself a house. It's it's very different. There's there's a sense of looking for a meaning in in what we do. Mm. Do you think that's changing? Do you think that's really, do you think that's new? I don't think it's new. I mean, I think it was always sort of there in the social justice aspects. So, I mean, in the very beginning, coming mm -hmm. from war, coming from trauma, there's there's deeper reasons. There's no, I don't think there was ever a sense of this just being a one-on-one -on -one clinical practice. Mm -hmm. But I think people are coming into a new awareness of that as, uh, maybe it's a personal thing, as each generation sort of hits that, oh, what am I here for kind of point and, and starts to face the generational challenges. It's like, oh, we've done it again. Now we have to deal yeah. with this problem in a new iteration. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That does, that, that does feel there's a cyclical thing mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. Well, you left me thinking. <laughs> so, is there is there anything else that you would like to add at this point, either about yourself, your practice, your interests, final thoughts? Hmm. 
I don't think so. Oh. It's been an it's been interesting. <laughs> it's been an experience. It's been a. I wonder if I will have. Um, so here's some of my discomfort with endings that. Mm -hmm. comes up. I, there's a wonderful expression in French. I know you're a linguist called esprit d'escalier, the mm -hmm. spirit of the stairs. And I wonder if I'll, you know, I'll say goodbye and then go, oh, I wish I'd asked <laughs> this or said this. But um, so yeah, there's always that sense of reg regret or fear, is, fear of having missed something. But I guess that's mm -hmm. what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we can talk again another time. We might always leave sort of those, those little three dots at the end. So. I look yeah. forward to actually meeting the people that I'm meeting. So yeah, and thank you for doing this. You know, there is maybe this is what I want to say that I I have actually I have loved the accessibility of Gestalt that's been opened up by this year, this this mm -hmm. pandemic. Te teaching with Joe Malnick in December, we had people waking up in California, people way past their bedtime in Turkey people who would not have been able to afford to fly anywhere for the program. Mm -hmm. um, and your work in having us be able to, you know, read somebody's book and then go click on their little face and mm -hmm. just hear about their life. It's such a gift to the whole community. So um, mm. long may that opening up and accessibility continue. And thanks for the part you're playing in it. Thank you. It's been very, very nice to meet you. So thank you for your part too. It's my pleasure. Okay, if we leave it here. Sure. See you soon.